continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and today's program is about a beautiful mind, about the extraordinary book that is journalist Sylvia Nasser's singular achievement, about the extraordinary film it suggested that is now Ron Howard's and Russell Crowe's and their colleagues' Academy Award winner, and about the extraordinary mind itself that is Nobel laureate John Nash's. Now, Sylvia Nasser, my guest today, has been a writer at Fortune magazine, a columnist at U.S. News and World Report, and from 1991 to 1999, a reporter at the New York Times. Now she holds the night chair in journalism at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Professor Nasser's brilliantly written A Beautiful Mind, The Life of Mathematical Genius and Nobel Laureate John Nash, published by Simon & Schuster, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in biography. But I want to ask my guest today whether, as a journalist, she was really surprised by an incident she described this way not so long ago. I was invited to a colleague's class at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism to talk about a beautiful mind. The class is called Writing About Ideas but not a single student asked me about Nash's Nobel Prize winning work. What they most wanted to hear was tabloid fare, and that brought home just how far from reality the discussion about Nash has gone. But I want to ask my guest whether this doesn't more importantly bring home just how far from older and better, from higher standards, today's would-be journalists have come. Well, I thought that a lot. That put you on the spot. That did put me on the spot. I would say that in that episode in which, in which lots of, main, of mainstream reporters and reviewers repeated things about someone who is alive, someone who is vulnerable, uh, that they never bothered to check whether they were true. Uh, I thought it brought out the worst, but also the best. Okay. The best? Well, um, at the end of the day, journalists like Mike Wallace um, uh, did tremendous amount of reporting and, and, and uh, went on TV and said, none of this is true. I spent a day and a half with John Nash and his family, and all these things are not true. Uh, now. It's also, it's also the case that a lot of people who uh, never looked at the book, never picked up the telephone, never talked to Nash or anyone who knew him, said terrible things about him. Why do you think that was true, by the way? Well, I don't think it was ever about Nash or about the book. I think it was uh, a you know, saying that the, the, uh, the character, you know, the Russell Crowe character that evoked all that admiration, all those tears, that, is re that was really a fraud perpetrated by these filmmakers. The real person is no hero at all. I mean, it was, it was a way to get at the film. Uh, but it was being said by people who knew nothing about Nash, and not only knew nothing, but 
didn't feel responsible for finding out what the facts were and repeated the most scurrilous, nasty things about him without ever even you know, opening the book. Do you think that this was primarily related to the battle over who was going to win the Best Picture Award in the Academy Awards? I think that you know that that's a reasonable that's a reasonable inference but to me it was never it, it was never about whether some low level flack at some studio planted something on Matt Drudge I mean you know I don't think that it wouldn't have gone anywhere it wouldn't have gone anywhere if a lot of um of journalists at at good publications, at good stations, hadn't repeated, repeated these allegations, and not even as allegations, as fact. Well, now, you say you don't believe it was just that some low-level functionary at a studio. How about high-level functionaries? What I'm saying is, it doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter. The journalists had to pick it up. That's right. It wouldn't, ha it would have died, okay? Uh, you know. That's right. It would have died, and it would never. It was the fact that it was that these things were repeated in respected publications that gave it all the aura of truth. Okay, so when, and it just it just came home to me when I went when I went to that class that you know here were people who um, who you know, were studying to become journalists who, um, you know, and all they, in a class where, uh, where the subject was ideas, but all that they had heard about John Nash from the media what were these scurrilous allegations. I'm sure you found that a great many people uh, could not uh, understand the uh, intricacies of Nash's contributions, however well you presented them, and you do present them just beautifully in a beautiful mind. I mean, it's, to yeah. me, astonishing Thank that you. anyone could do that. But isn't that an indication of the softness of reading habits today, the softness of intellectual exchange, the softness of journalism? Well, now you're going to reveal me as as a real Pollyanna and optimist because when I think about when I think about uh, the book and the movie, what I find extraordinary is that so many people have have read uh, a book about a mathematician. <laughs> Uh, a book that is not light on ideas. I think that's I think that's a wonderful sign. I I I didn't know that. Uh, I mean, it wasn't my expectation. And certainly, when Ron Howard set out to make this movie, no one at Imagine or Universal expected it to be a box office success. I mean, they they felt just as I felt when I set out to write the book that. Writing a book that, that making a movie about a mathematician who lived in that rarefied world and lived inside his own head, you know, always thinking. I mean, that's what John Nash has spent his life doing, just thinking that trying to take that to a, a mainstream audience was, was just a real stretch. And the fact that people responded the way they did. I think says great things about about uh, readers and moviegoers. What do you do with the criticism? And it is criticism uh, that so many people responded because Ron Howard actually made a film that could have been suggested by your book, but that wasn't a film that was made out of your book. Is that a to what degree is that a fair or an unfair criticism? Well, I think it's a fair characterization that that the film was inspired by the life, inspired by the book, but it's not a literal retelling. It's certainly not uh, a, a straight biopic, uh, and uh, it fictionalizes the life. However, 
I would also say that um, that it, you know, just as um, you know, I, I've told Nash's story not just in 450 pages, uh, but also in a, the newspaper article, which is how, in the New York Times, which is how this whole thing got started, and the things that, you know, and lots of, the, of course, there are uh, lots of the details that are in the book are not are not in the piece, but it, it emphasized, I think, what is most compelling about John Nash's life and, and the very things that make it meaningful to people who uh, don't know much about mathematics or mental illness when they come to it, and that is the, this extraordinary arc of his life, the genius, the madness, the reawakening, uh, the, uh, and the extraordinary role played in his reemergence by the woman who loved him and by his friends in the mathematics community. You know, I. What drew me to the story in the first place? That was my question. Okay, when I first heard a rumor that Nash might win a Nobel, uh, what drew me was the following, that there are, I mean, m literature, and I was a literature major, literature and theater are full of stories about meteoric rises followed by tragic falls, okay? Uh, you know, Icarus, Oscar Wilde, there are dozens, you know, many, many stories, but there are very, very few stories, much less real lives, that have a genuine third act, okay? And this is what Nash had. Who would, see, I didn't know anything about mental illness, but to me, the notion that someone actually came back from 30 years of paranoid schizophrenia, I didn't know that was possible. That the idea that he not only survived, but got a Nobel, you know, to me, it's, it was sounded like, it sounded like a fairy tale. That's what drew me. And now, to hear, to hear that life that I think is so uplifting and inspiring, and I hope that's the way I wrote my New York Times story, I hope that's the way I wrote my book, because that's how I felt about it. To hear that described as a series of scandals, and you know, a dark and bitter and depressing a tale that really was something very different from, from the inspiring one that you know, people saw in, in the movie, doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> in, your, in your research and in your writing and in your viewing of the film, uh, did you come to any conclusions on your, of your own on the connection between genius and madness? Well, um, yeah, I, I did, and of course I thought about it a tremendous amount because the book opens with a scene where Nash has been hospitalized for the first time as always, against his will. Someone comes to see him, and this mathematician asks Nash, uh, how could you, uh, you know, a mathematician devoted to, ra how could you believe that these extra extraterrestrials want you to save the world? And Nash answers that these, um, uh, these ideas about supernatural beings came to me the same way my mathematical ideas did, so I took them seriously. Um, look, full-blown schizophrenia devastated Nash's creative powers and intellect. Okay, he was, uh, and in fact, looking back at other artists, other creative geniuses, I re I could really only identify one, and that is Nijinsky, who who became ill in his early twenties and never danced again, who fit you know who 
was a genius who also suffered from schizophrenia. However, uh, before Nash got ill, he was very, very eccentric. And one of his eccentricities was this tremendous indifference to what other people thought. Another was a, an extraordinary ability to concentrate on very um, difficult, high-risk problems, problems that no one thought he had a prayer of solving. Okay. And thirdly, his, his other striking quality was that he not only didn't study what other people had done. I mean, some of, these, some of the problems that he solved were, had been tackled by the greatest mathematicians of the last, you know, the past century. He not only didn't read what they had to say about, about these fields, he, he made a religion out of never absorbing what someone else, because he wanted to do it his own way. So that origin, you know, that willingness to pursue what looked like bizarre strategies in solving these problems, that's, of course, what enabled him to crack these big problems. Well, when I <laughs> first read A Beautiful Mind, um, I was thinking of a program that we did here. God help me back 40 years, no, more than that, almost 50 years ago with Lionel Trilling, uh, Nathan Klein, who I used to call the mad psychiatrist, a very dear friend, and Isaac Stern, and it was about uh, creativity and mental illness. And I, I, I kept having this feeling that I was living through that again and wondering what conclusions you came to about not a necessary connection, yeah. but about the way in which, um, as he says, as, as you say, he, you begin the book, with this notion that he heard these, he saw these figures through the same mental process that made for his genius. Yeah. And uh, what does it teach us? Or, is, or do you conclude here was just a, not just, but here was an extraordinary man, a beautiful mind. We don't find many. And it's the story of that mind and of that man uh, and move on to the next subject? Or did you get some sense of uh, a connection between madness and genius? Well, I think that there's a connection between, between, <laughs> between originality uh, and the willingness to uh, trust. You see, what did he do? I mean, Nash, Nash uh, had great faith in his own intuition. He was an intuitive genius. He saw, he saw the solution long before he understood how to get there. Okay, and he saw solutions in places where no one else that no one else thought was worth looking at. Now, isn't that that people who like that are very difficult socially. Okay. <laughs> they're not, they don't, uh, you know, they don't go along, they don't please other people, they're often not that aware of other people's needs, all these things. But it's also what makes them so creative, what makes them able to see things that nobody else can see. And Every one of Nash's breakthroughs were, very, were, th were things that flew in the face of the sort of received opinion mm -hmm. in that field. Starting with the game theory, he, uh, he went up against John von Neumann, who was the most powerful, glamorous, or the inventor of game theory, someone who, uh, who told Nash right, right to his face that he didn't think much of his idea. Now, this is the idea that eventually got Nash the Nobel and had a huge impact in economics. Okay, but he, 
uh, thumbed his nose at the great man. And, and um, in pure mathematics, he did exactly the same thing. He just went, he went down a road. And it is, it is related to a temperament that was both inward looking, uh, kind of defiant, and very indifferent to convention and what other people thought. He wasn't into pleasing people. <laughs> and obviously a personality or a way of thinking that was very appealing to you. You're right. And not to mention, not to mention to Alicia Nash, who fell in love with him. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, when he was in his 20s and, and a rising star. Look, how can you... I was enchanted by him. I was enchanted by the idea of him, and then when I got to know him, which, frankly, was not until... Um, I mean, I, I talked to him a number of times in the two and a half years that I was working on the book, but he did not cooperate on the book. He... Uh, refused to give me a formal interview, or any formal interviews. Um, he was, uh, he wrote me an email when I started out saying, Dear Mrs. Nasser, uh, I, as, it's a matter of as a matter of principle, I don't seek personal publicity. I've refused to be listed in who's who, and I have decided to take a position of Swiss neutrality toward your project. However, However, after after the book after the book appeared, some months after the book appeared, he decided to be to become to become friends, and um, it is he's an extra, he is a very extraordinary person. He's like no one else I've ever known, and what makes him so extraordinary is, of course, this this. Um, First of all, complete openness in the sense that he he says what he thinks, a unbelievable sense of humor, uh, very dry. Um, the um, the the morning after the Academy Awards, I called him up. I said, well, "How do you feel? How do you feel?" <laughs> and uh, of course, he wanted to talk about Russell Crowe and and the fact. What that did he say? <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you what he said comparing the Oscars and the, uh, and the um, uh, Nobels. Uh, they both involve academies and they both involve a lot of politics. Your description, by the way, of the politics of the award, the Nobel uh, Prize Award, uh, really quite fantastic. Um, enormously revealing. Uh, you're not going to b go back to those people again, are you? Because you didn't wait for 50 years. And 50 years is the time yeah. it's supposed to elapse yeah. before there's any discussion of what goes on. Right. It's the whole Nobel process is shrouded in secrecy. And um, I had no idea that there was a story that Nash, that the prize was almost voted down uh, the morning it was to be announced. I had no idea. There was one clue that the call uh, that was made to him came an hour and a half after it was supposed to, at 7.30 instead of 6. And once again, you know, in a way, it's a testament to how people felt about this man that a, he got the prize, and B, that I was able to piece together the story by interviewing a lot of people in the committee and around. You say the way they felt about the man. Yeah. Do you mean that, or do you mean the way they felt about his ideas, his contributions? Well, I don't think there was ever much controversy from the moment that the committee in, in Stockholm uh, started thinking about a prize From in game, game theory, theory right. which was back in the mid-80s, I don't think there was ever a serious question about Nash's, that Nash was the seminal figure who was still living. Von Neumann, of course, is dead. I don't think they, there was ever a question about that. And if they were going to give a prize for 
the part of game theory that's had such a big influence on economics, there was no question. The question was always about the man. It was always about whether, whether you could give the highest of scientific honors to someone who, with his history of mental illness, okay? There were people on the committee in the academy who argued that you can never recover from schizophrenia. You are so transformed by the illness that, quote, this is not the same man who had the ideas. We have about one minute left, Professor Nasser, and I want to ask you whether you think this is essentially uh, understanding Nash, understanding what happened to him is essentially a woman's prerogative. <laughs> well, I think that I think that it has the the book and the movie struck a real chord with with women. Um, and I look, I think it this has to do with the fact that women, um, as well as men, but often women, are the main caretakers of people who ha suffer from serious mental illnesses. And for them, this story is both very hopeful, but it's also very acknowledging. It acknowledges the life-saving role that, that you know, these, these people play. And, and I think that's important. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia Nassau. I hope everyone reads, well, the business, let's say, you've seen the movie, now read the book, because <laughs> the book is a beautiful book, a beautiful mind. Sylvia Nassau, thank you so much for joining me here on The Open Mind. Thank you, Dick. It's lovely. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977. FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.